Goha Jan's stately and austere beauty had been mellowed somewhat by age. Her hazel green eyes were surrounded by wrinkles, and time had begun to cast her features in its soft, cruel mold. Her quota still attracted patrons, but the number of its visitors had dwindled. Their sudden and radical turnabout in life after partition had created a deep feeling of uncertainty. A growing sense of frugality in all affairs had followed. It had adversely affected the fortunes of the Tawaif's enclave, a world that thrived on extravagance and where people traditionally flaunted their wealth and fine tastes. The mafils ended in many kothas. The drapes in the kothas remained drawn. The wooden staircases smell of dampness. The carpets had not been aired in a long time and were musty. In the music rooms, tanpuras gathered dust under the silken wraps and their necks became bent from the humidity. The silence of the sarangis continued unbroken, and the heads of the tablas and pakhavads became wrinkled and dry. The quiet of the music rooms was broken sometimes by the sound of a string snapping. The neighborhood seemed more alive in daytime than at night. Most of the nayakas had moved out from the courthouse to find a trade in which their training in the musical arts could advance a career. Many had joined the fledgling film industry. In the last year, two nayakas had left Gohajan's kotha. One had migrated, another tried to open her own kotha in another neighborhood, but failing to attract new patrons closed it down. Only one nayaka, Malka, remained with Gohajan. The only other occupant of the kotha was Gohajan's old retainer, Bande Ali, who had been associated with it for nearly three decades. He was in charge of the mafils and also looked after the kotha's finances. Every evening, he made sure that the pandans were stocked, the drinks ready, the white floor coverings spread in the music room, and bolsters placed for the guests. Two servants were also on hand to fill the hookahs for visitors, refresh them at regular intervals, and run errands if the guests wished to send for food from the bazaar or call the conveyance at the evening's end. Bandeli usually finished his preparations an hour before the mafil started. Then he had his customary cup of tea before opening the doors of the kotha. After the musicians arrived, he sat on his sofa at the entrance where he greeted visitors. Malka received the guests at the door of the music room, offered them pan and ushered them in where the musicians were already seated and awaiting Goharjan. At the end of the mafil, the guests left their payment in a money box. While the servants cleared up the room, Bandeli did his accounting. After the house staff left, he closed the kotha doors and retired to his room on the top floor of the building to sip his cup of opium. Bandeli gave the account of the Kota's finances to Gohajan regularly on the 5th of every month. But in recent days, the exercise made him uncomfortable. Having been associated with the Kota and its finances for so long, he felt he was himself somehow to blame for its declining income. Gohajan had been quietly selling her gold since the previous year to maintain the Kota on the same lavish scale as before. Bandeli was the only person who knew about this. Gohajan had forbidden him from discussing it even with Malka. He had quietly suggested to Gohajan a few times that she could rent out the Kota's western wing, which had a separate entrance and was no longer occupied by two Nayakas. But each time Bandeli made his suggestion, Gohajan declined it, with the same equanimity with which she received the account of her diminishing income.